Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3.3 3, KJV Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The Messiah was explaining to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, 5, a concept that was fundamental to understanding the kingdom of God, but often misunderstood. The Messiah was not talking about a spiritual rebirth that occurs later in life, as is commonly taught in many Christian circles. Instead, he was referring to a divine begetting that occurs at conception for a specific lineage of people. Christ used the word anothen, which means from above or from the beginning, rather than deuteros, which means again or a second time. This distinction is crucial to the interpretation. Jesus was telling Nicodemus that to perceive or enter the kingdom of God, one must be begotten from above, that is, be part of a specific lineage that God had established through Abraham and Sarah. This divine begetting is said to have occurred when God miraculously enabled Abraham and Sarah to conceive Isaac in their old age. The phrase, born of water and spirit, is interpreted here not as physical birth followed by a later spiritual rebirth, but as referring to the natural process of conception, water, combined with the divine spirit imparted at that same moment to those of this specific lineage. The Messiah was explaining to Nicodemus that comprehension of the kingdom of God is not something that can be achieved through later conversion or spiritual experience, but is inherent from conception in those who are descendants of Abraham through Isaac. Nicodemus, as a teacher in Israel, should have understood this concept from the Old Testament teachings about Israel being God's firstborn and the importance of Abraham's begetting chosen sons in Sarah's womb in establishing this divine lineage. In essence, this view presents Jesus as explaining to Nicodemus a matter of divine election and heritage, rather than individual spiritual transformation. It's a perspective that challenges many common interpretations of this passage and presents a view of salvation and spiritual understanding that is limited to a specific genetic line rather than being universally available. In most translations, the phrase born again traditionally implies that a second birth is necessary to enter the kingdom of God. However, many Bibles include a margin note indicating that the original manuscripts suggest from above. When examining the actual words spoken, it becomes clear that it was Nicodemus who inferred the idea of re-entering his mother's womb for a second birth. This interpretation was Nicodemus's own and not what the Messiah said. Contrary to what some translations suggest, the Messiah did not use the word again, deuteros in Greek, meaning twice or again, which appears 44 times in the New Testament. Instead, the Messiah used the word anothen, meaning from above. Strong's G509, anothen. Anothen. From above, from
from a higher place of things which come from heaven or God, from the first, from the beginning, from the very first anew, over again. Understanding the distinction between anathen, from above, and deuteros, again, is crucial, as it reveals issues with the common interpretation of Jesus' words. In his conversation with Nicodemus, Jesus clarified that he wasn't discussing a second birth, but rather being born of water and spirit. Importantly, Jesus used present tense, not future tense as Nicodemus did, indicating he was referring to an existing condition, not a future event. Many Christian teachings have inadvertently adopted Nicodemus's misunderstanding rather than Jesus's actual words. Jesus reproached Nicodemus for not grasping these concepts despite being a religious teacher. Similarly, modern religious instructors often lack understanding of these nuances. Jesus further explained that not everyone is spiritually begotten at physical birth. He distinguished between what is born of flesh, referring to ordinary physical birth, and what is born of spirit, implying a special spiritual begetting for some at conception. This suggests a fundamental difference in spiritual status from birth, rather than a later spiritual transformation. To explore the meaning of the word, another, let's examine various examples of how it has been translated. From above, from a higher place of things which come from heaven or God, from the first, from the beginning, from the very first anew, over again. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom. Mark 1538 KJV. This signifies the restoration of direct access to God for the scattered tribes of Israel through the Messiah's sacrifice. The tearing of the veil symbolizes the end of the separation between God and his people, particularly the lost and dispersed Israelites, and reaffirms their unique covenant relationship with God. This act underscores that the Messiah's mission was to reunite and redeem the children of Israel, providing them direct communion with God without the traditional temple-based intercessions. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, Luke 1.3 KJV. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, emphasizes that the Gospel of Luke was meticulously written with a clear and comprehensive understanding of events. The purpose of this careful documentation was to provide an accurate account of the Messiah's life and teachings, specifically for the scattered tribes of Israel. Theophilus, likely a fellow Israelite or a high-ranking individual among them, is addressed to ensure he, and by extension all Israelites, have a reliable narrative that reaffirms their exclusive covenant relationship with God and the fulfillment of promises through the Messiah. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. The verse highlights that the Messiah, who comes from above, heaven, holds a position of superiority over those who are earthly. This underscores the Messiah's unique role and divine mission to gather and restore the lost and scattered tribes of Israel. It reinforces the belief that the Messiah's teachings and actions are of divine origin and authority, meant specifically to fulfill God's promises to Israel. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. John 19.11 KJV this verse underscores the significance of the Messiah's crucifixion in fulfilling the prophetic scriptures specifically for the lost tribes of Israel. The seamless coat symbolizes the unity and integrity of the Messiah's mission and his role as the high priest for Israel. This act of dividing his garments among the soldiers fulfills Psalm 22:18, highlighting that the events surrounding the Messiah's death were part of God's divine plan for the redemption and unification of the scattered Israelites. The detail of the seamless coat further signifies the perfection and wholeness of the Messiah's sacrifice for his. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. 
John 19.23, KJV. This verse highlights the divine authority and predetermined plan of God concerning the Messiah's mission. The Messiah acknowledges that any power the earthly authorities have over him is granted by God, affirming that his suffering and sacrifice are part of God's sovereign plan for the redemption and restoration of the lost tribes of Israel. The statement also emphasizes the greater accountability of those who betrayed the Messiah, indicating their deeper culpability in opposing God's plan for his chosen people, Israel, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify, that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Acts 26, 5 KJV. This verse highlights Paul's background and strict adherence to Pharisaic Judaism. This verse is significant as it underscores Paul's deep roots and credibility within the Israelite religious tradition. By emphasizing his Pharisaic background, Paul establishes his authority and connection to the Israelite faith, making his message about the Messiah's mission to the lost tribes of Israel more compelling. His transition from a strict Pharisee to a follower and proponent of the Messiah illustrates the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel through the Messiah, showing that even those from the most stringent sect of Judaism recognize and testify to the Messiah's role in Israel's redemption. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This verse emphasizes the consistent and unwavering nature of God's blessings to His chosen people, Israel. This verse highlights that all blessings, wisdom, and spiritual gifts given to the Israelites come directly from God, who is described as the Father of lights. This underscores God's unchanging and faithful character in fulfilling His promises to Israel. The reference to God being constant and without change assures the scattered tribes of Israel that God's covenant and intentions for their restoration and redemption remain steadfast and reliable. The Israelites can trust in God's perfect gifts and guidance as they seek to return to their rightful place and relationship with Him. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. In this verse, James underscores the divine nature of true wisdom bestowed upon the Israelites by God. This wisdom, which originates from above, reflects the characteristics of purity, peace, gentleness, and mercy. It produces good fruits in the lives of the Israelites and is marked by fairness and sincerity. For the scattered tribes of Israel, this verse reassures them that the guidance and understanding they receive from God are perfect and righteous. It encourages them to seek this divine wisdom, which aligns with God's covenant and promises to Israel. This wisdom helps them live in harmony and righteousness, embodying the true nature of God's chosen people. It also emphasizes that this wisdom is a gift from God, meant to guide the Israelites in their unique relationship with Him, free from hypocrisy and partiality. The phrase, formed from the womb, holds significant importance for the Israelites, as it underscores God's intimate involvement in their creation and destiny. It serves as a divine affirmation of their chosen status and special relationship with God, conveying that this relationship is not incidental, but intentionally designed from the earliest stages of life. The concept also reinforces God's sovereignty and ongoing care, providing assurance that He is continually involved in guiding, protecting, and sustaining the Israelites. Overall, it elevates their understanding of their own identity and value in the eyes of God. Isaiah 44, 2. Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jeserin, whom I have chosen. Isaiah 44, 2 conveys that the Most High has intimately created and formed the Israelites from the very beginning of their existence in the womb. The verse also reassures them of God's ongoing help and support. By addressing Jacob and using the poetic name Jeshurun, God emphasizes their chosen status and encourages them not to be afraid as he is continually involved in their lives. Overall, the verse serves to affirm God's sovereign role in creating, choosing, and sustaining the Israelites. As quoted above, speaking of Sarah, we find the womb described as the hole of the pit. 
This metaphor extends to the mountain from which the stone kingdom is taken. This is God's mine. James, who wrote to the twelve tribes, said, Of his own will he begat us Israelites with the word of truth. James 1.18 As has been shown, begat primarily pertains to conception, not physical birth. Isaiah 51 verse 1 Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. This verse encourages the people of Israel to remember their origins and the foundations of their faith. The imagery of being hewn from a rock and dug from a pit serves as a reminder of their humble beginnings and God's hand in their formation and history. Isaiah 51 verse 2 Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. Isaiah 51 verse 2 calls the Israelites to remember their ancestors Abraham and Sarah, emphasizing that their nation began with just one man whom God called and blessed. The verse serves as a reminder of God's faithfulness and power to fulfill his promises, encouraging the Israelites to trust in God even in challenging times. Overall, it connects the Israelites to their divine heritage and underscores the enduring nature of God's covenant with them. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. Here again, the Lord is speaking to Israel only. Nowhere in Scripture can we find reference to the Lord being the Redeemer of any other people apart from those of Israel who are formed from the womb.